I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to turn to 1 John, the first chapter. And a couple of things I want to share with you as the plates are coming around. One is, uh, just if you don't know, uh, I preach the same text, the same series, the same big idea of the message at Station Hill as Mike does to you each Sunday on this campus. Aaron does the same at Avenue South, and Dr. Walton is doing the same right now at West Franklin in the interim there as we transition that church family. Uh, but you need to know that we're all focused on the same big idea. So I want you guys to just hear a humble request from me that when you open up God's Word on this campus every Sunday, that you would be praying for the folks at Station Hill, praying for the folks in uh, Nashville, praying for the folks uh, in West Franklin, uh, praying for all of our campuses and venues uh, as they open up God's Word. And part of the joy for us is that we get to gather on Monday afternoons. Uh, so it's always interesting when I'm here, people say, oh, I haven't seen you in so long. I'm here every week uh, as we gather for worship planning and preaching team meetings and leadership team meetings. Uh, but I don't get to see all of you. But one of the great joys of our time together is that uh, Mike leads us in a study of God's Word as we get to open it up together. and Iron sharpens iron a little bit uh, in his office every Monday afternoon. So that's a time you can be praying as well uh, as we come together to share the things that God has taught us out of the text so we can teach it to you uh, out of the overflow. And if you know anything about the genesis of this series, Summer School, uh, you'll be reminded of the fact that for the past several years, we would do a series in the summer called Things Your Pastor Wants You to Know. And basically, that was code for whatever we felt like preaching during the summers we were going to preach. Uh, so we had our own uh, leeway on each of our campuses to do that, and we do that from time to time. But we decided as a preaching team, it might be interesting to flip the script a little bit this summer. And so back in the spring, we pulled you online and we asked our church congregation, what are the topics that you would like to hear us preach on? And so we started two weeks ago with talking about the nature and the identity of Jesus. Last week, we talked about the inspiration of scripture and God's word. But what was very interesting to me, the third topic that you wanted to hear the most about was about guilt and forgiveness. In other words, really quick, it got personal. Yeah, there are, there are these big topics that are very important that we need to understand. But this, for many of us, is where the rubber meets the road in our lives. And many of us, as parts of participants in the life of this church and as followers of Jesus Christ, we deal with these feelings of guilt that are inside of us, these pangs of the conscience that come from the Holy Spirit, and we wonder and we struggle what to do with that. Because in my experience as a pastor, nothing holds people back from fully participating in all that God wants them to be a part of, as does sin, as does walking in the darkness, as we're going to see in a few moments, and realizing that doesn't line up with the life I claim that I lead. And so this word guilt, Guilt is a real word for us. It's a heavy word for us. And it's one that God's word treats very, very seriously. And guilt is the word that best describes the look on the face of my five-year-old daughter a few years back. I had taken her with me to one of my speaking engagements at summer camp. This is my middle daughter, Lexi. And she's kind of my experienced girl. And so uh, I was speaking at this youth camp in, in the middle of Alabama and thought it would be a good week for her to go with me, create some daddy-daughter bonding moments and memories, and uh, during our free time, be able to go canoeing and enjoy the, the things to do there at the camp. And so I had taken Lexi with me. And one afternoon, I had emptied my pockets on an end table, and I was distracted doing something. And I came back into the room to find that she had taken one of my golf tees and she was carving on that end table. Now, I looked at her, and she looked at me, and this look came over her face, and the first words out of her mouth were, Daddy, I didn't do it. <laughs> Just sheer denial, right? Didn't do what, Lexi? What do you feel so guilty about? And she said, well, I didn't, didn't carve my name on that table with your golf tee right there. Of course, I could see her handwriting, knew exactly what she had done in that moment. The next moment, she switched tactics, seeing that she wasn't getting anywhere with the denial. And so she tried to turn on the charm, right? Like a five-year-old daughter will do. Daddy, I love you. Daddy, thanks for bringing me to camp. It's been so fun. Lexi, I love you too. However, we've got to deal with this issue. And so I tried to put on my best parenting hat and we began to talk through what needed to take place. I made her admit to me, first of all, what she has done, had done and that it was wrong. And then I tried to come up with a plan so this would be a teachable moment for Lexi. And so I came up with this. I said, Lexi, I don't own this cabin. I don't own that end table. It belongs to this camp. And so when we see the camp director, I'm gonna need you to go up to him and tell him what you've done and you need to ask him what you need to do to make it right. 
And so we agreed. And, uh, and for whatever reason, circumstances, we didn't see the camp director for the next couple days. He was busy. He was in meetings, whatever. And so I could watch Lexi growing more and more nervous as the days went on, as the hours ticked by. She was kind of always scanning the room for this gentleman. And I could see that in her mind, you know, things were beginning to get a little anxious for her and she was beginning to be nervous. She'd ask me questions. Daddy, what do you think he's going to make me do? And I'd have a little bit of fun with this one, you know, maybe he's going to make you wash all of the dishes or, you know, maybe he's going to make you pay for it out of your allowance, you know. And so I stretched it a little bit with her. And so finally, it was a couple nights later and the camp director shows up in the mess hall in the dining commons. And so Lexi, I nudged her and said, there he is. And she was like, yeah, I know. And so I got her out of her seat and I said, you need to go tell him what you did. And so she walks her five-year-old self over to him, says, Mr. Camp Director, I'm sorry that I carved my name on your end table. I won't ever do it again. And then with a big crocodile tear rolling down her cheek, she said, I'm ready to go to jail now. (laughs) Needless to say, I don't think graffiti or defacing property has been an issue for Lexi ever since. She spent her time in the pen down in Alabama. So, but uh, no, she got off a little lighter than that, but uh, it was a teachable moment for her. But Lexi's little situation, I think, illustrates for all of us what takes place. We make deliberate choices to live contrary to God's will. Maybe we choose to be deliberately disobedient to something we know that God's word has prompted us to do. And so inside of us grows this creeping sense of guilt and shame. And feelings that are what we call with the girls and our kids, icky feelings. Something doesn't feel right. And what ends up happening is, is we put ourselves in a prison of our own making, emotionally, psychologically, but certainly spiritually, to where we feel helpless. We feel disconnected from our relationship with God. And we feel like God cannot use us. We feel totally impotent spiritually because we're not dealing with the stuff in our own life, much let alone, uh, much less ready to share the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. You need to know that's never the way that God intended his people to live. And while he very clearly deals with sin in his word over and over again, he also very clearly gives his people a way to freedom, a way to know the life that he intends them to lead. And we find that in 1 John chapter 1. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10 together this morning. Now this is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. And there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in the darkness, we are lying and are not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, He is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we don't have any sin, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Father, we certainly live in a dark world. We pray today that in continuing, instead of continuing to be tempted, drawn towards the darkness, instead the illuminating light of your word would shine on our lives in such a way that we respond to the Holy Spirit and the way he convicts us of our sin and our continual and constant need to be cleansed and forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray today that you would open our hearts and our lives to the truth and our need for self-examination and forgiveness. Father, be with us now as we study your word. We love you. And it's in your son's name we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. 
So in this text today, we're going to look at this one overarching truth about the nature and character of God and how it illuminates or reveals to us the three ways that we struggle with the idea of sin, guilt, and forgiveness. What's interesting is it's always important for us to go back and grab the context, especially when we're in a topical series and moving from book to book of the background of the book that we're studying. We know that 1 John was written by the Apostle John. We know that he was writing it from his now ministry base of Ephesus to many of those early churches that were struggling with how to live out the gospel in the context of the communities in which those churches had been planted. And John's little book kind of defies an easy outline, but like many of us, there were themes, there were truths that were important to John, and he keeps coming back to them time and time again. So you find over and over in his letter these themes that God is life, that God is love, 1 John 4, and that God is light. Look at me at verse 1 of this book. And John says, this is what we have heard from the beginning, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed, what we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. In the prologue to his gospel, John reminded us that the word had become flesh. And so John is sharing with us for what, him, for what was for him the very most important message of all, that Jesus had come to us and he had come to us so that we could know life the way that God always intended it. Look at verse four. Why does John say he's writing this letter? We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. What does John want for us? He wants the joy of a spirit-saturated, Christ-filled life. He realizes that one of the things that robs that life from us is our sin, is our guilt, and is our shame. Instead, John says, God wants you to be complete. He says in John 10, 10, I want you to have life, life more abundantly. Now, I'm not talking about just circumstantial happiness. The fact that feelings come and feelings go about how good our day is. No, he's... (coughs) Excuse me, preaching three times. Got to get used to this. He says that I want you to have lasting joy. Joy that superintends your circumstances. Joy that is lasting. Joy that comes only from knowing the freedom and depth and love of a relationship with God and his plan and his purpose in your life. And so in verse 5, he turns to the illuminating truth and says, Now this is the message that we have heard from him, from Jesus. And we now declare to you, John says, I'm telling you what Jesus taught me. God is light and in him there is no darkness. Theologians say this is one of the most comprehensive word pictures for the nature and character of God. God is light. It goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. God spoke into the darkness and created the light. All throughout the Old Testament, light is a powerful metaphor for his holiness, for his power, for what only God could do. Jesus says in the Gospels, I am the light of the world, and the Holy Spirit guides us into all things concerning the light. Is this constant thread throughout scriptures. And not only is it true of God's nature and character, but of his ability and his power to shine in a dark world as well, to reveal and uncover cover the truth. Think about it this way. Light piercing a dark room illuminates everything. The things we try to hide, the things we try to put in the closet, the things we try to sweep underneath the rug. A couple of weeks ago, we had some summer company come over. It was kind of spontaneous. It was kind of one of those last minute appointments. My wife often jokes, if you want to come see my house, make an appointment. If you want to come see me, just drop on in. Well, this was more of the latter. And so this friend called, hey, we're going to be around. Hey, why don't you come over for dinner? Great. So it was about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. My wife went into that mode of, hey, we got to get the house picked up. We got to get things clean because whatever she says, she still wants that house clean. And she still wants that meal cooked. And she wants to be a good hostess when that moment comes. And so I did the dusting of the downstairs. And I did my typical guy dusting thing, right? Took me all of five minutes, right? I dusted all the high points, everything that was eye level that I thought anybody could see. The problem was when we sat down in our dining room, which faces the west, it was about 6.30 at night. And the sun was setting. 
And those powerful beams of sunlight beamed right into our dining room. And as the meal went on, my wife's eyes would scan the room and she would kick me under the table. I thought you cleaned this room. What about those cobwebs? What about that dust? I see where you took the shortcut and instead of using the pan, you just pushed it under the table. I was in trouble. Why? Because the light revealed what I thought was hidden. And the same is true. The light of God in our lives. When we truly come under the authority of his word. When we truly examine our own hearts with the penetrating rays of his nature and character then we realize how much we've just shoved under the rug, how much we've hidden in the corner or in the closet. And so there are all kinds of ways that we have devised to deal with this in our lives. We read an article this week in the preaching team by a Christian counselor who talked about the way that Christians typically deal with guilt. The first form is denial. Just like my little girl, what did I do? I didn't do anything. And even in doing so, we're admitting that we have done something. And so we try to deny it for as long as we possibly can. We try to pretend like everything's okay. And we put on the face and we go through the show and we go through the motions when inside of us, our spirit and our soul is caving and dying because there is a guilt and a weight that we are carrying that we have not dealt with. The second thing we tend to do, we rationalize, we justify we make up all kinds of excuses, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden when they were hiding from God in the world's first episode of guilt and shame. They're hiding. God says, where are you? In essence, I'm right here where I've always been, but look where you're at. And we tend to do the same thing. Adam, what does he do? He blames Eve. He passes the buck. And then he blames God. It's the woman who you gave to be with me. We're masters at passing the buck, rationalizing, justifying. The other thing we do sometimes is we compare. We put ourselves, instead of holding ourselves to the standard of God's word in a relationship with Jesus Christ, we look at the people around us and say, ah, I'm not doing so bad compared to him. Look at their family. Look at that situation. Look at that guy that I work with. All of the time, muting the voice of the Holy Spirit that God has put inside of our hearts to prick our conscience to tell us, no, this isn't the way I intended you to live. Think about all of the emotional energy we spend denying and justifying, and if we would just put that into walking with Christ instead of trying to cover it up, how much different our lives would be. When we moved into our new home a couple of years ago, our old home had a fence, and we had a little black cockapoo. His name is Bentley. We like to tell people we have a black Bentley at our house. It's pretty fun. The problem with Bentley is he's a great dog, loves to be with the family, but he's what I call a runner. In other words, anytime that door swings open, he's looking for his shot at freedom. And so at our old house, we had a fence. We'd let him out in the backyard. Everything was okay. If we had company and kids in and out, it wasn't a big deal. We just put him out in the backyard. Well, we don't have a fence anymore. So my wife went online, did a little research. We bought one of those shock collar things. And so she walked patiently with him around the boundary of her property, just giving him a little shock if he got out of bounds, trying to teach him what or the boundary was and why he needed to stay inside of it for his own protection ultimately. And so over time, of course, Bentley learned that he would push the boundaries of his envelope and give him a little shock and he'd get back in it. But over time, it took two shocks. It took turning the thing up to 50% power. It took cranking the thing to full power. And to this day, right now, we don't even use that shock collar. Why? Because Bentley learned, if I just take the hit, the shock, I'm scot-free. I can chase cars all day long. <laughs> and our hearts operate the same way. Over time, the Holy Spirit pricks our conscience. That decision, that choice isn't in line with God's will for you. It's not in line with his word. It's not in the light. And yet we mute that voice over and over again. We learn to take the hit, so to speak, take the shock so that we can be free to do whatever we want to do. What's the problem with that? Someday Bentley's going to get run over by a car. He's going to get damaged so permanently there's no coming back. And the issue for us when we ignore and don't spend time thinking and self-examining ourselves about our sin and our need for the gospel in our own lives is that over time we mute that to the point that we become in danger of hitting that no comeback zone 
in our lives. That's not what God wants. So with every one of these heirs, there is a remedy. What is the remedy in this situation? To walk in the light. Jesus Christ has already gone before us. He has showed us the way. Psalm 119, he has given us his word as a lamp into our feet and a light into our path so that we can know the way. And when that happens, our fellowship with him is restored. And what else does the word say? The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Underline, highlight that word cleanses. It's in the present tense. In other words, it's a continual, repeated action that we need in our lives. Now let me make something very clear here. John is talking about the need we have for forgiveness in the family, forgiveness in our relationship with God, our ongoing relationship. When you come to Christ for the first time, when you confess your sin and you admit your need for the gospel in a relationship with him, then there is what we call judicial forgiveness that is given to you once and for all because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's the greatest gift that we're ever given, forgiveness of our sins and new life in him. However, on an ongoing basis, just like in any of our earthly relationships, we mess up, we make bad choices, we don't do things that we know that we should do, and that damages our relationship disrupts our relationship with our spouse, with our friends, with our coworkers, with others. And what do we have to do? We have to learn to go back and say, honey, I'm sorry. I was angry when I spoke those words. To learn to tell our children, I'm sorry. I missed that opportunity. I wasn't paying attention. We have to learn in order to keep that relationship healthy, to keep coming back time and time again, humbling ourselves and admitting where we were wrong. If we have a relationship with our heavenly father, the same truth applies. Once you are a believer, yes, ultimately your sins are forgiven and you are free. And yet God never breaks his relationship, his covenant with us, and yet we're pushing the boundary all of the time. Why? Because it's our old nature. And so because of that, we've got to learn to come back to God over and over again. Because here's the second issue we deal with. We're amazing at lying to ourselves. Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us, John writes. In other words, John, follower of Jesus, apostle, disciple, he's saying he struggles with it too. And if we just try to gloss it over, if we lie to ourselves that everything is really okay when it's not, then we deny the very truth of Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's the standard. And if we were left in that predicament, we would be in trouble. But God gives his people away. Look at verse nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That word confess in the original language literally means to say the same thing. In other words, what John is reminding us of is that in the act of confession, we are telling God for our own good what he already knows to be true. So don't think that you can hide like Adam and Eve in the garden. It seems silly to us that they would try to hide from God behind some bushes, right? But the reality is, is we do the same thing emotionally and spiritually all the time. We mess up, we sin, we try to go run and hide. And God is there saying, where are you? Where are you? The truth is, is he knows exactly where we're at. He's asking us that question for our own good, to reveal the state and the nature of our own hearts and our need for him. So if we will trust the word, If we will confess, self-examine ourselves. See, as David says in the Psalms, is there any way in me that is impure? Because may the meditation in my heart and the words of my mouth be found pleasing in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. That's the way that we want to live. And for us to constantly be examining ourselves and confessing to Jesus our shortcomings and our need for him. What happens? He is faithful and just 
two huge and very important words for us. To recognize that our forgiveness is not dependent upon our ability to be perfect, but on his perfect covenant love for us. And that every time we do this, he will be faithful. Why? Because that's consistent with his character and his nature. And just, what does that mean? It means that you and I faced a penalty that we could not pay. But what did God do in his own love? He sent Jesus to pay the penalty on the cross so that the demands of the law would be met and yet we could be free as his people. What only God could do, God did. But what do we continue to do? Look at verse 10. If we say we don't have any sin, we make him to be a liar. And his word is not in us. The third error that we make is that we make God out to be a liar when we don't trust his word. There are many of us in this room who have heard this passage preached, read this passage our whole lives, and yet we don't believe it's for us. We tend to say, man, my sin, pastor, you don't know what I've done. My past, you have no idea how many people I've hurt. This issue that somebody did to me, you have no idea how it's twisted and warped me. And we tend to live out of that false identity instead of living out of the true identity that says, for you, there is a gift that is offered of salvation and hope and freedom and forgiveness in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We tend to trust our feelings instead of trusting the word. What's more, we believe the lies of the enemy. And what is one of the names given for Satan? Accuser. We always think of Satan as the tempter, which he certainly is. But we forget that one of his primary purposes is to frustrate God's children by constantly accusing them about their sin and about their past. And so we make God out to be a liar when we trust in our own feelings more than his word. When we listen to the lies of the enemy more than we trust in his word. What does the word say? Confess your sins and he will be faithful and just to forgive them. Amen. We don't trust. We don't trust our feelings. We don't listen to the enemy. Instead, we put our feet down on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we say, what the word says about me is more important than anything else that I could believe. 